So welcome to another episode of The Zach Kiley Show. Today I have the honor of being with Jason Han. So Jason Han was born and raised in South Korea until the age of 10. He came here with his family and attended Columbia University and Perelman School of Medicine, where he was the student body president. He's currently a cardiac surgery resident at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania and the vice president of TSRA, which is their national governing body. He's broadly interested in communication, education, and leadership, especially as it concerns patients and staff. He's written a column for the Philadelphia Inquirer for seven years and has written essays for the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of American College of Cardiology, and many more. So the way I start off these episodes is reading about statistics around cardiothoracic surgery specifically because that is your specialty, and then if you have any inputs or insights or thoughts about those. So, okay, burnout percentage. 35% compared to 47% average. That's pretty good. EM actually tops that at 60%, and public health is at the bottom at 26%. When asked, would you stay in your specialty again, Derm and ortho win at 99 and 97%. Uh, Surgery is in the middle at 83%. That's pretty good. And internal medicine, the specialty I'm thinking about going into, is at the bottom at 63%. The median salary of an academic or associate professor at an academic institution is 339,000. The the median salary for a general surgery salary is 445,000 and the median salary for a CT surgeon is $712,000. Uh, The hours training a week or the hours working as an attending every week is 51 hours generally. General surgery is 60 hours and CT surgery gets a little bit higher at 62 hours. In regards to training, uh, the average step two score is 248 for surgeons compared to 245. And then overall training, and this can change a little bit, I think we'll probably discuss this, uh, is five years research year and then maybe two years of the fellowship going into CT surgery. But I know there are different residency fellowship paths to get to the CT surgery. So first off, any of those statistics stand out to you? Anything you want to mention or talk about? Yeah, well, thanks for, thanks for having me here. Thanks for I mean, coming on. I really appreciate seeing you. <laughs> When I take in those statistics, I think this is a small comment, but it's so funny to me that we're talking about average step two scores because when I was applying, it wasn't something that we really thought about or averaged, you know, like we, we simply based everything on step one scores, you know, like that's, that was, and then I think about when I started applying to residency and that was already seven years ago. Wow. So, uh, it's been some time, but, uh, I mean, the statistics that you read out to me are really interesting to me because I think it, it points to the, the passion and the intensity of cardiac surgery, right? I mean, it's commensurate with the fact that you're working more hours than probably an average physician or or even a general surgeon. Um, there's a high degree of unpredictability in your schedule because a lot of the things that we deal with are emergencies, mm-hmm. right? So you operate on a patient at, at any point, somebody may call you and say, hey, this patient doesn't look good, has to go back to the OR tonight. And that could be 1 a.m., right? So there's some there has to be some passion behind all of this. And I think that ties into the burnout rates that we're talking about as well. I mean, I've been training as a cardiac surgery resident for for six years now, as I mentioned. And and, and the moments when I feel burnt out and the moments that I feel really rewarded are uh, have a gray sort of way of overlapping with each other. And I'll go into that a little bit further. It's not necessarily that when you work more, that you feel more burnt out. You know, the moments that make you feel burnt out um, may sometimes be during the weeks that you have worked the least because you feel like you've been most, you know, disengaged from the kind of personal fulfillment or growth that you're looking for. It could be paradoxically that the the moment that you feel the most engaged in your career is is the week where you worked nonstop, right? And then did this operation all night. And then you walk away from it thinking like, wow, like this is why I'm so in love with the field, mm-hmm. right? So there's some paradoxical element of how I think about burnout because especially in a high intensity field like this, you know, burnout can be actually cured with finding more personal engagement if you find the right ways of getting that person there, right? Mm-hmm. So so maybe the things that are asking, you know, getting people to feel um, more engaged about the field are not necessarily cutting back, um, you know, cutting back hours, but leaning in a little bit more in moments where you think that it's going to be very meaningful. Um, for me, like being able to spend the extra hour with a family member, even after a long operation and then knowing how they feel about the whole thing is is an extra hour of reward mm. you know so in that sense i tie those two statistics together you know there there may be more hours um but then at the same time it doesn't mean that people feel more burnt out it, mm. it could mean that 
people want to keep on staying in this field because because that's what they signed up for in the beginning. I think yeah. they were making passion-based decisions. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And I want to point out two things, what you said. Lean in. That's the fourth time I've heard this expression with people, and I'm stealing it now from yeah. people because it's such a good expression. And I wish I was kind of, I kind of, Thought it, when I had my first clinical rotation ever, right, it was OBGYN. I didn't think I was going to be an OBGYN. Yeah. But someone told me two days in, you know, just lean in. Just go for it. Be at every procedure. Learn as much as you can about obstetrics and gynecology, and you're going to have a much better experience. And I think I did. So, so take that in mind, people. I think, it's, I think it's really helpful. The second thing I want to ask about is you're at one of the top institutions in the world, right? Yeah. You personally, does that play into burnout or feelings of burnout at all? Is it a competitive feeling? Are you trying to be one-up colleagues or anything like that? Or is that not true? No, honestly, I think people who tend to go into cardiac surgery are competitive by nature. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you're competitive against your colleagues. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, I know that people are, you know, competing over many different things in the field of surgery, right? They may be eventually in their careers competing over volume they may be competing over outcomes they may be competing to see who has you know more high impact papers and whatnot you can compete about anything but really the only competition that matters at the end of the day is how much as a field you can provide high quality care to your patients right so when i think about competition um from day one i think it's really about getting all of your colleagues to succeed succeed at the same rate succeed huh? yeah <laughs> not kidding. succeed but succeed <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and I say that because at the end of the day, no matter how good a surgeon you are, you're never going to be able to do as much work as two well-trained surgeons competing at a high level. Um, and, and that's more important to me, I think, as we think about treating disease because we are going to face shortages in the future, right? Yeah. So the competition, I think, has shifted in my mind from, hey, can I get to that training spot and can I be... Uh, the quote unquote best resident to like, how can we get everyone in this program to succeed in the way that will ultimately benefit the field long term? Because mm -hmm. if you think of it that way, then the day to day competitions among people, among trainees becomes pretty meaningless. Yeah. Like you're competing against something so much larger. Um, and there's also technical elements of competition every single day where you just want to be better. You know, like you, we talked about this phrase leaning in literally every day of surgical residency is walking into situations where you may not feel 100% comfortable. Like I think by definition, surgical training is like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm 100% ready for this. And then trying to figure out how you can feel like you've had growth by the end of the day, Yeah. right? And that's an inherently uncomfortable process. Like every single day I wake up and I'm like, oh, I really hope I get through this case and do a good job. And I think if it were something that I could just walk into and not worry about, then Perhaps I wouldn't feel as driven at the same time. So it's a necessary part of training. But you're constantly competing against your former self, like on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that just goes on for the rest of your life beyond training. Because the surgeons who really care about that aspect of their, of their you know, craft will keep on asking that question even after they become attendings. Yeah. At that point, no one's going to look at your, your, operating, your operating and then be like, hey, like you messed that up except for yourself, you know? So there are surgeons who keep on going down that path for 30 years and the operation that they're able to perfect at the end of their career is a beautiful thing, right? Because it's somebody who's obsessed over how to do this better for a long period of time and, and that really shows. Yeah, and I think you need that difficulty for growth, right? I think there's a, a couple papers that show at around the 85% difficulty mark is when this kind of magic happens, when you learn the best, when you're performing the best, uh, and maybe you even get in the flow state, which I'm sure yeah. you're familiar with. So you have a kind of different career, a different background uh, than some people. You know, you're a writer, you're doing all these different, now you're doing this modern surgeon <laughs> yeah. thing, which is really cool, which we'll definitely talk about later. Um, but my question is, how do you, do these other things and medicine. Did you ever think, I want to be a writer full-time and not do medicine? Or was it, you know, this is just a thing on the side I'm going to do? You know, I think I've always had a very entrepreneurial personality. Yeah. Like even in college, I wasn't necessarily in the pre-med groups. I was trying anything and everything that I was interested in. So, I mean, my college activities were like something entrepreneurial, a little bit of student government, a little bit of cultural organizations, an acapella group. And in fact, way back then, my pre-med advisor looked at me and said, are you sure you want to become a physician? Because you haven't really done like the standard activities. So I think that's par for the course for who I've been 
you know, my whole life. And uh, the reason why I get in, interested in all of these types of side projects is because I think that, you know, even though medicine and surgery are a highly sort of, if you, you can think of it as like a highly spe specialized and isolated craft, you have to make it relatable to society in some way, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's a human practice. You're treating human, pe you know, you're treating people and you're, you're guiding them through a very fundamentally human experience. You know, if, you, if you're not thinking about the other types of ideas that affect us on a day-to-day -day basis, then I think we're losing touch with that aspect of our care. You know, so for me, like when I think about doing uh, written, pro like writing projects or media projects, I'm not necessarily thinking that this is something that takes me away from my surgical practice. I'm trying to think about the gaps within surgical practice that I'm trying to overcome through those projects. Because I really think that what we need more than anything right now in the practice of surgery is to be able to connect with our patients more deeply, whether that be through, you know, sort of understanding their emotions better or communicating about their disease processes better or, you know, like helping them get through complications or even navigate more difficult aspects of their post-operative care. You know, like that's, that's where I think surgeons could do more. So all these conversations that we're having right now, to me, relate very deeply to my surgical specialty. So are you seeing issues when you communicate to patients? They just, is it they simply have no idea what's going on? Do you see other physicians doing this? Where's, where are you seeing the gaps specifically? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think cardiac surgery has really advanced to sci-fi levels of yeah. technical <laughs> sophistication. I mean, it, it, even if I'm having a conversation with an educated audience. Probably me even, I wouldn't know what you're talking about. A, a lot of people would be shocked to know what we're actually capable of right now, right? I mean, the kind of progress that's been made in the field, like, the, the whole concept of how, you know, heart transplants happen and mechanical hearts became available, different valvular technologies, and, and the level at which we can carry out these advanced procedures with the kind of outcomes that we're having uh, still feel kind of sci-fi to me, mm. right? But it's incredibly technical and nuanced. And I think as the technology in the field advanced at a very rapid rate, you know, sometimes maybe, you know, what we need to do is communicate with, the people who may be requiring these services and explain to them what's going on, right? I mean, maybe 50 years ago, people used to come to their surgeon and then it used to be a much more, you know, much shorter conversation. But now just to have a basic conversation about what open heart surgery you may need and what you might see afterhand, you know, you know after the procedure and then what kind of devices are involved and what kind of labs we're following. I mean, that is... An entire medical school curriculum, right? So, so how can we get them just educated and involved enough that that we feel like we're walking them, we're walking with them side by side, as opposed to just kind of asking them to sign up for the procedure and then and then seeing if they feel better? I think I think that's where we're trying to to get better at this whole thing. And I want to bring up something that, and you're familiar with Dr. Okasanya, something he told me in yeah. when I was talking to him, in which it's kind of stunned me at first because I I didn't even think about this, but he told me. He thinks the clinic is the most important place, the most the most place where the most important decisions, the biggest chance for mistakes come in. And it's, it was just stunning to me. And it, I guess it kind of makes sense because that's the place where you're signing people up for these surgeries and you have to explain to them, listen, there's maybe a five, I just randomly, maybe there's a 5% chance you could die. Yeah. You're putting your life in my hands, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, I completely agree with uh, with Benga. And, yeah. and he's been a mentor figure to me for, for over 10 years. Um, the clinic is the least appreciated and the least researched aspect of what we do as surgeons, without a doubt. But, but I think it's the highest impact as well. Those conversations with the patient and their family set the tone for virtually everything that follows. Their expectations, how they can plan around it so that they can get back to their lives safely. Like all of these things need to be answered in a way that I think meets a certain type of criteria. You know, I... Uh, if let's say that you and I were, were both busy and all of a sudden we needed to have surgery, right? I mean, that's a very complicated thing to fit into your life because all of a sudden now you're saying, how can I meet this deadline and how can I keep on doing the things that I like to do? How can I tell my family so that they're not concerned about me, et cetera? How do I balance all of that so that I can keep on living my life to the best extent possible? That's a really complicated thing to think about, right? Like if it were me, I think I would want a very detailed plan. Uh, oftentimes, I think the the plans that we're providing families is a is is too curt of a version to be able to allow something like that to happen. 
Because you're given yeah. 20 minutes, right? On yeah. average, right? Right. It's a very short conversation. And oftentimes I think, you know, people are not able to go fully in depth about what to expect about every detail because, well, that's that's a lot to open up in a conversation because that'll lead to a question after a question after a question. And you don't really know what the appropriate amount to cover in that conversation is, you know, but, uh, but that's something that we need to work on. It's just not studied at all, right? Because yeah. like who thinks about the clinic and, and that kind of process as, as the main quote unquote job of a surgeon? Uh, we don't really think of it that way. And, and it almost worries me even more when you think about the dichotomies and the conversations different levels of educated people are going to have with their physician, right? If you go into the cardiothoracic surgeon and have a discussion with the cardiothoracic surgeon about the surgery that's going to be done on you, it's going to be a very different conversation than I have, which is going to be a very different conversation than someone who never went to college. Yeah, you're totally right. And, you know, uh, I, can o- I can almost imagine reading a transcript of one conversation versus another depending on an educational level. And you both have 30 minutes And depending on that, like the amount of stuff that you can cover and the kind of questions that you can ask, how nuanced it is, will vary tremendously, right? But but at the end of the day, that's how we carry out both of those situations right now. Huge gap, huge gap. Really interesting. Let's talk more about you, though. So you were telling me (laughs) in uh, undergraduate, you weren't really sure about medicine. When when did the thoughts come in? When was the decision made? Yeah, you know, uh, I always liked science and biology and and I thought that I was always leaning towards medicine but I didn't necessarily want it to be a narrow path you know I one of the reasons why I like medicine the most is because you know no matter what kind of interest you may have there is a bridge to medicine right I mean we think of going to medical school as this big step towards specialization but really like you can think of studying medicine as a way of opening up your opportunities you can still go to med school and become somebody who's interested in, in, in media or writing or entrepreneurship or business or anything, right? I mean, it just gives you a way of connecting with that kind of material in a different way. So I never really thought of going to med school as necessarily a way, that, a place where I have to fold these under interests and then focus on one thing more specifically. I mean, obviously it requires a certain amount of time to keep up with yeah. um, a medical career. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, uh, my interest has sort of vaguely been around medicine since I was younger and then going into college. And then by trying out all these different things and then knowing that I wanted to incorporate it into my medical career only cemented it further. And then uh, that's, that's sort of how I approach my residency training as well. And, and at each step of the way, I think the, the balance shifts a little bit more, right? I mean, in med school, I had a little more time than I do now. And then surely for the rest of my career as a surgeon, it'll, it'll be that way, keep shifting in that direction. But but it's, it's interesting to keep that alive. Yeah. And I love that answer because I think it's it's bold to make that answer in a, in a way because I think a lot of people feel they need to say, you know, patients are my life, which I'm sure they're very important and things like that. But it's like I had this amazing interaction with a patient and things like I'm thinking back to my medical school interviews right now. Yeah. But really, honestly, and I'm going to be truly open for the first time in a long time here on this podcast. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but I have the same feelings. I think the MD, the medical education is a great opening point. It doesn't it's not a narrowing point. It's an opening point for you to get interested and learn about all these different fields because healthcare is always going to be there. Right. And it's always going to be important to people. So it's a fantastic, fantastic thing to do. And it doesn't necessarily need to be like, you know, I'm going to be with patients all the time. We need people who are going to be doing other aspects around making patient and doctor interactions better, around making devices better for patients, around making new drugs, all these things. It doesn't necessarily have to be, even though it should be a a good reason why you're going into it, that you're going to be a clinician with patients. I completely, I, um, you know, a lot of people think of medicine as as, as as a scientific pursuit. Um, a lot of people think of surgery as a technical pursuit, but you and I both know that it's so much more than that. And it's just that a lot of those other aspects don't get focused on enough, I think. But there's, I mean, simultaneously, there's a whole lot of room for improvement in those areas. Yes. So <laughs> if you're thinking more broadly in the field of medicine and surgery, I think, I think it's actually a strength. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree 100%. So CT surgery. First, I realized I never asked you the question. Loaded what, term. <laughs> what is CT surgery? Yeah, it's, uh, it's cardiothoracic surgery. You know, uh, in this country, the, the training pathway for both fields, cardiac, which is dealing with the heart and the major blood vessels in the chest, uh, and thoracic, which is dealing with all the other organs in the thoracic cavity, such as your lungs and esophagus and et cetera, are, are, are a combined specialty. So we call it CT surgery. And it's a, 
this is what someone was explaining to me the other day. It's a residency, not necessarily a fellowship. So there's multiple ways of going yes. into the field. <clears throat> um, and I won't get into too many details, yeah. but you can either go into it straight out of med school, which is a commitment. You know, like like we talked about earlier, you're signing up for a potentially six to eight year residency in a highly specialized field straight out of med school. I think that requires really asking yourself if this is what you want, right? Um, versus you can go into a general surgical residency, finish that training, graduate from it, and then apply to a fellowship in CT surgery, which is a two to three year experience in this country. So there's two different ways of going about it, broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. There is this integrated pathway where you dive straight into it. And then there is a general surgical and then traditional fellowship pathway where you gain a broader set of skills and perspectives along the way and then reapply for more specialized training. What did you do? I went straight into it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you, you prefaced the decision. You need to do a lot of thinking and a lot of personal thought. What was your thinking? What were your personal thoughts making this decision? Yeah. I mean, you know, you this reminds me of the whole burnout conversation yeah. in the beginning. Like the thing that you do every single day has to fundamentally rejuvenate you. And you may not understand why it's rejuvenating you, but when you're in the OR and you're operating, like you got to be happy. I think, I think a lot of people look at the field of CT surgery and it's a complicated question, right? There's a, there's a high salary. There's a lot of power and respect that comes with it, undeniably, I think, because of the nature of 100%. your work. And uh, there's certainly room for things like, you know, personal glorification, um, self-importance, et cetera. There's, there's a lot of incentives for considering a field like CT surgery. But I mean, at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, am I in love with the image of CT surgery or am I in love with CT surgery? Because for me, the only thing that really should guide you towards that decision is when you're in the OR and you're watching an operation or, or you're in an operation and you blink an eye and you look up at the clock, how much time has gone by? You know, more than you expected or less than you expected? Mm -hmm. And I think we've all been in situations clinically where you look up at the clock and you're like, I can't believe it's only been 10 minutes yeah. as opposed to, wow, I can't believe an hour has gone by. Like yesterday, I did two operations. You know, it started at something like nine in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then by the time I scrubbed out, it was three in the morning, Whoa. right? Um, How much did you sleep last night? Because you, wait, three in the morning is this morning, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I slept about four hours yeah. before coming here this morning. Yeah. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great way to start a Saturday. Um, I guess, I guess my point is when you're in the OR, like you don't feel like if you're really engaged with what you're doing before you, like you don't feel hunger or fatigue until the moment you scrub out. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's, that's the kind of intensity and the engagement that, that I'm looking for in my career. Yeah. You know, that's why you keep coming back to it for more, right? Because yeah. you're like, you, you get into that zone and then you just, you're just in that you know flow state kind of thing the whole time. And, uh, and and yeah, that's the kind of that's the kind of decision making that went into my CT surgical you know the, you know career choice because because there's obviously a lot of sacrifices that have to be made along the way, right? I mean, I sacrificed four hours of sleep that I could have had more last night. Well, you also before, sacrificed before another podcast. two or three to come in. You know, what I mean, you could have slept more at home. <laughs> yeah, and and those are things that 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 you think about, and then you ultimately make a decision that, that this is the primary thing that that gives me more gratification than necessarily the sacrifices that I'm making. Because the sacrifices, even if you're tired or at times not able to make the events that you want to or have the flexi flexibility that you want to, people live with sacrifices in all aspects of their lives, right? Mm -hmm. No matter what kind of career you choose, you're going to be contending with that. Yeah. But the primary drive that you, that, that you find in going into a specialty, it, it has to be, I think, really authentic. And yeah. to ask yourself that requires a pretty significant degree of self-awareness because, because you're going to need to put yourself in situations where you're sleep deprived for a week and then ask yourself, wow, do I still love operating? Or is it like, oh, I loved it when I was really well rested. And then I find myself like kind of not as into it as I'm making these sacrifices. Like, these are all things that, that you learn about yourself at early stages of your training. Yeah. And, and they're hard questions, but you need to be really honest with yourself about them. And 
Was it in, how did you decide in medical school? Was it, did you make the decision, because uh, they often tell us, you know, do you want to be in the OR or do you want to do medicine? That's the first thing you should think about. Did you have an experience in med school that's like, surgery's for me, the OR's for me? Uh, was it kind of a slow decision, like third or fourth year, you like kind of were scrambling to make the decision or how did you come to it? Yeah, you know, honestly, I know that's the most common advice that's given. Yeah. I personally don't subscribe by Got that, it. the OR versus non-OR thing. Yeah. Um, because if I didn't go into CT surgery, I think my second choice specialty would have been psychiatry or mm, neurology, right? And I think it's about it's about the questions and the anatomy and the physiology that make your brain tick. At the end of the day, like I think if I were having a really interesting conversation related to somebody's psychi- psychiatry or 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 you know thought process and and making them get from point A to point B, helping them get from point A to point B, that's in my mind, something as intentional and precise as a surgical procedure. It's just mm-hmm. that you're not necessarily using your hands, right? Mm-hmm. So the environment plays a big role, but I, I really wanted to be attuned to what kinds of things that I liked thinking about. Yeah, You know, uh, CT surgery at the end of the day, the operations, when they're going smoothly and you're following everything that's going on in the OR, there's nothing quite like it. Got it. You know, so, but, uh, but it wasn't like an OR versus non-OR thing for me. I see, I see. So you had a, uh, a clinical experience, was it third year, that you're just like, this is this is it? It was even before that. Even you know? before that. Yeah, I, I took a, so as I mentioned, like my pre-med advisor <clears throat> looked at my no application and said, <laughs> like, you know, maybe you should take a year out because I'm not <laughs> convinced that you want to become a doctor right now. So I, I ended up looking for a job and serendipitously through a friend of a friend, I ended up working for uh, cardiologists and CT surgeons at cool. Columbia, which is my alma mater. Yeah. So at the time, I was in, introduced to the field for the very first time. And then to understand what I was doing clinically, I went to the OR a couple of times to watch one of the surgeons there. One of the surgeons who's you know, highly, highly revered in the field of CT surgery. And as I was watching that operation, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing, right? I mean, the way that the sutures were so fine and the hands were moving so quickly, like that was, it was mesmerizing. Mm. Yeah, and then once I fa- once I had that experience, I think I came into med school trying to really answer that question, as I mentioned earlier, of I know I find it mesmerizing, but is the entire field and the lifestyle and the career something that I can personally sustain and be happy in? Yeah. And I, and I spent four years answering that question. Yeah. No, it's an important question to answer because I think a lot of students, right? I was speaking to, I remember my first year of medical school, there was a student who was 20 years old. And what they yeah. do, they do this Penn State program and they go directly through. And I think it's good and bad, right? If if you know exactly what you want to do and you've done this personal analysis like you did that says, I'm going to be a CT surgeon or I'm going to be an internist or I'm going to be a psychiatrist, I know 100%, then that's perfect. But I think a lot of people just go through the motions. And I think it's something that I've even f- fallen into because, you know, you just go to undergraduate, then you go to med school, then you're going to pick this residency because you're told to pick a residency. And before you know <laughs> it, you're in a fellowship and you've been training for 10 years and you're not really sure what you want to do. So I think it's vital that people take this thought and take this really in-depth thinking of what their life is going to be like after they make this decision. And yeah. that's one of the reasons I do this entire podcast, right? Yeah. Because I want people to know what the life is like that they're signing up for. Because we don't think, I don't think I got a good enough view. I didn't speak to as many, I didn't even know cardiothoracic surgery was a thing until a year ago. Yeah, I and now you're going to go into it. So. Right, <laughs> exactly. I'm going straight into it. So it's, so it's, so it's crazy. I mean, this I think this is a reflective process. Yeah. Like what you're doing here, it's in part you're having a conversation, but with all this information, you're reflecting on who you are, right? Because going into med school, being pre-med, being success- successful in school, and then applying to a highly competitive program, et cetera, for the rest of your life, it feels like a checklist experience. You're sort of, you know, checking things off and then getting to that next step. You could get through the whole thing without ever really thinking about who you are as a person. You know, if you if you wanted to just keep on following the roadmap of something and following what people tell you is the right thing to do, you have to force yourself to keep questioning why you're doing something and is this something that resonates with me? Who am I in this process, in this environment? Like those are questions that you need to ask yourself by reflection, I think. Yeah. That's the reason why I write. You know, I uh, in the same way that you're exploring these ideas yeah. through your project, I uh, for me, when I write, it's a way of taking all these jumbled ideas and patient experiences and difficulties of residency and et cetera, taking that all and putting it on a piece of paper and then coming up with a clearer version of self-narrative that makes me feel like I, I understand myself a little bit more at the end of the day yeah. or, or at least gives me a roadmap to who I want to be 
better as a person, you know? So, yeah. so I think we're all engaging in some sorts of these activities that help us feel that way. It just, uh, it takes work. It's almost like a meta-analysis of yourself. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough. So let's talk about the the residency, the training a little bit. Can you tell us about it? Like what year one, two, three, four, five, and six, and seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve 12 are like? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Broadly speaking, you know, I think most of the experience in residency is clinical. There are some programs that build in a couple of years of research. It's not mandatory, but a lot of people who are interested in academia tend to take some research time. But clinically speaking... You know, we, we, like, we believe that we have a graduated experience, right? So when you're first entering into a surgical residency, you still need to be a doctor. So you're taking care of patients on the floor. You're seeing consults. You're trying to understand the disease process. All this time you're, you know, reading textbooks or whatever. You know, nowadays people are just engaging in more digital education and then taking in information and just you just become more nuanced as a thinker in that space and a provider. And then over time, you keep on making your way into the OR. And then you get your hands moving. You're starting with very basic components of a procedure. You're learning to close skin. And once your skin closure looks perfect, then you close the next most important thing. And then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then that journey continues until one day you're doing a skin-to-skin operation. And it doesn't... (laughs) The experience is not as smooth and graduated as I make it seem right now in this conversation. Some days it comes slow. Some days you're finding yourself in a really, really steep learning curve. Um, but whatever the case, I think it just you're trying to get yourself from somebody who's just an outside observer into the field into somebody who feels ultimately comfortable driving the ship in that field, right? So that's a, that's a huge amount of responsibility that's laid on your shoulders by the end of the whole thing. Um, going through it personally right now, um, the, the way that it works is that you you kind of, every single day you're assigned uh, a couple of cases. Um, you know, depending on what level you are, you find appropriate levels of complexity and difficulty. So maybe when you're starting out as a senior level trainee, you're getting yourself into an operation that's more bread and butter, quote unquote, mm-hmm. in cardiac surgery. Um, and then as you find yourself at the, at, at the final stages of your training, you end up going into the 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 highest complexity cases, the ones that you may have to realistically deal with in a couple of years as an attending. So uh, that that's that's how it. And graduates. what year of training are you in? I am six out of eight. Six out of eight. Got yeah. it. And do you do because you went cardiothoracic surgery from the beginning? So are you doing more general surgery things in the kind of first couple of years, and then when is the transition to more CT surgery kind of stuff? Yeah. So for the pathway that I'm in. Yeah. Um, CT surgery is sort of infused throughout the entire thing from the beginning. Yeah, got it. You have general surgical and, you know, some vascular <clears throat> fundamentals that you need to, criteria that you need to meet. Yeah. But beyond that, you know, cardiology education, uh, meeting our colleagues in different sort of cardiac related subspecialties such as EP or interventional cardiology, et cetera. That's all incorporated into our training from early on. Because the idea is that more and more, uh, the the idea of a cardiac surgeon is somebody who's a comprehensive specialist who not only learns how to sew but is un, you know is aware of how the broad heart team quote unquote care of a patient can take place and that requires being able to be fluent in many different languages um, and I think six to eight years of training gives you gives you that uh, yeah. which I've really enjoyed in the last you know, as as I'm growing into that role. How many hours a week are you working? Um. It's variable. Yeah. Can you give me a range? Um, yeah. I think I think at the moment I'm working somewhere between 70 to 80. 70 to 80. Okay. Yeah. And it depends on the rotation that you're on. Sometimes yeah. it's less than that. Sometimes it edges more than that. Yeah. Um, but I think overall it averages out to about that amount. Yeah. Yeah. Well, last night you were there till 3 a.m., right? Yeah. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> and did the hours get better as you go through, as you get later in your career in residency? Or are they kind of standard throughout? It's interesting that you asked that because that is definitely a way of thinking about residency. Yeah. You know, I, I talk to people who are in plastic surgery yeah. or urology or neurosurgery who say that things get lighter as they become more chief level because, you know, they don't have to be in-house as much or something like that. But CT surgery, I think, is one of those maybe unusual specialties where it's just going to get harder as you go through. I see. Yeah, I mean, and I say that because fundamentally as you get more trained, the more operative responsibilities and patient care responsibilities that you have right? As you're able to be the the resident or the fellow 
who's able to get through these really tough cases overnight. Let's say a type A dissection comes in overnight. And, and by, by nature, the person who's very senior is going to be the one responsible for coordinating that and then going to the OR and staying up all night to do it. All right. So more and more as I get higher in my levels of training, the more responsibilities yeah. I have on my shoulders and more hours. Yeah. Yeah. And you're in a very competitive program. You were in a very competitive yeah. program beforehand. Um, do you have any and because you've clearly you're clearly very smart and you've clearly excelled in your career. What do you do? Do you have any specific tactics of uh, kind of staying ahead of the game during residency or anything like that? Like speaking to Dr. Okasanya, for example, <laughs> he said he had an Evernote list where he'd keep track of every single uh, procedure that an attending would do, and he'd write down their notes as well as his notes. And then he bought a thick textbook that yeah. was just like surgery, like yeah. cardiothoracic <laughs> surgery. And he'd come home, and every night, no matter what, he'd read three or four pages of the yeah. book, just like front to back. Yeah. Do you have any similar strategies or any techniques or anything that kind of keeps you... Because you're, again, in one of the top one, two, three programs in the world. Yeah. Like, how do you? How did you get there? How do you stay there? What are your tips and tricks? <laughs> Credits to him for being able to come home at the end of the night <laughs> and reading the same textbook. Thing. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, for me, uh, so some elements of my answer are similar. Yeah. Like, so for instance, so much of preparing for surgery and learning surgery is about what you can do beforehand, right? Because if you think about going into what is inherently a highly overwhelming and stimulating environment, there's only so much you can learn from that, right? Like think about some of the situations that you've been in in your life, whether it be sports or music, and you go into a lesson or a performance, you're not taking away all of it. Your mind can only handle so much learning yeah. <laughs> in that one experience. And you don't want it to be overwhelming because if you feel like you're so far behind and out of touch, then then you kind of enter into this period of blackout where you're just trying to keep up with things and you don't necessarily feel like you're learning. You're just emotionally overwhelmed. Um, so you want to prepare as much of that as possible. And I do think it's possible to prepare a lot of the cognitive and technical aspects of surgery before you go into the OR. I mean, we do that with virtually everything else that we do. That's a performance, um, whether it's you know music or, or you know, whatever sport you play, you drill different aspects of it before you put it all together. So for me, that's always been a big part of my training. Like even early on, I strongly believed that things that I'll be doing, I don't know, tens of thousands of millions of times in my career, like tying a knot or throwing a suture, um, handling needles, like I wanted to be able to play with that in the same way that somebody might just, you know, kick around the soccer ball or something before while they're growing up. You know, like if you get that kind of stuff more comfortable in your hands early on, then when you're in a case, you're not worrying, am I going to drop this needle? And am I going to look silly here? Like you're trying to get your hands to, to move more autonomously with some muscle memory so that if an attending tells you, next time you throw that stitch, it, you need to think about a different needle angle. That, that's a more sophisticated takeaway that you can have from an operation because you are able to take mm -hmm. some of that emotional load of being technically unprepared out of the way, right? Like if you think about training in that way, you can go into an operation being as prepared as possible and walk away from it with five to 10 really high yield takeaways mm -hmm. at, in each case. You know, so uh, I think that's how I look at it. Every time I go into a same operation, I know what I'm prepared to do. I try to run it through my mind. I try to practice the needle angles at home on some sort of a simulator. And then I go into the case and then maybe the five mistakes that I think I could have, I can do better next time. I make a list of that. And then over time for any operation, that list gets shorter and shorter and shorter because you find it very manageable to walk away from a case and approach or address a few lists of things that you felt like you were overwhelmed to handle as opposed to being like, wow, that entire operation that just kind of flew by and I'm mm -hmm. not really sure what just happened. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a different experience. I think you can prepare so much before going to a case. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the specifics. So can you tell me, do you have a note-taking app? Do you have a notebook? What do you have? Yeah. You know, honestly, I don't have anything you know, high-tech or sophisticated yeah. when it comes to stuff like this. Yeah. What I do have is a simulator at home yeah. that I spend a lot of time designing and thinking about yeah. so that the needle angles that I'm working with at home are, are precise. Because then what I do is I walk away from it and I say, stitch number four in this anastomosis, I need to practice that. Mm. Right, like that's the kind of takeaway that I want to have from a case because then I can go home, I can put 
let's say, you know, a coronary graft in this location, and then I'm trying to sew it to this location. Yeah. I position, quote unquote, the heart in the simulator in a, per, in, a in, in a right location. And then now I know I can just practice that stitch over and over and yeah. over again. And I then see. tomorrow when I do the same case, stitch number four is is better. And then now I say, uh, stitch number four is better, but stitch number eight, that needs some work. You know, like, that's kind of like how I think about my note-taking. Yeah. I, I don't list every detail of an operation because I think that information exists. But you just need to keep track of where you are in your growth as a trainee by by making very specific feedback points for yourself. Mm -hmm. Feedback in general, I think, is something that is lacking in surgical training in a highly specific and actionable way. So you kind of have to give yourself these these guidelines, you know, to to focus on one aspect, your biggest weaknesses, and then to overcome them. How is the feedback from attendings or things like that? Or there, you know, before I came into med school, <laughs> my impression of surgeons and the OR was they'd throw things at you and they'd yell at you and things like that. How is your experience Not in the OR? Quite that malignant, yeah. <laughs> but the styles can be highly variable. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously feedback comes in all sorts of flavors. Yes. Some people can be really kind, but then it doesn't get you thinking in the way that you want it to be, or like, and some people can give you feedback in a way that you don't think is necessarily constructive. Yeah. Right. So uh, oftentimes the pain points for trainees on how they can get better are, I think, oblivious to attendings unless there's a conversation that takes place. So you might go into a case thinking, wow, this is like where I really want to get better. Yeah. And an attending surgeon may be walking into the same case, not thinking about the same kinds of high yield points where you, where, what, as what you're looking for. You know, getting getting that to be on the same wa same wavelength, I think, is is something that kind of needs to happen in the in the field of s surgical education. Yeah, more um, conversations, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we talked about kind of academics, quote unquote, in clinical training. Outside of that, how do you maintain? Because I I forget if you said, but you you said you maybe felt near burnt out before, but never felt completely burnt out. Is that correct? I mean, there's been some moments where I've definitely noticed burnt out, and Got you know, it. like it's it's a challenging thing, yeah. like. People talk about burnout all the time. Yeah. They don't know how to self-diagnose it. Yeah. Right? I mean, so you may be burnt out and not even realize it until you're two months in. Yeah. And then uh, and then you have a different experience that kind of gets you back on the course. Yeah. I, re resilience in many ways, I think, is flirting with burnout again and again and figuring out a, a way to stay afloat, right? Yeah. Like, because you're becoming aware of what makes you feel that way and then what makes you come back from that, those experiences. So, uh yeah, I mean, burnt out is something that I have experienced personally. Okay. It's just the symptoms are not so obvious to you when you're in it. Uh -huh. It's it's a gradual entrance. Yeah. You know, and before you know it, you're like, am I burnt out? Am I just tired? I'm not really sure. What are the yeah. symptoms? Uh, I think some of the some of the symptoms of burnout for me is going into an op going into your day to day work, not feeling the same amount of excitement as before. You know, because because I know when I'm feeling really awesome mm -hmm. in my training process. Yeah. You go into your job every single day believing this is the best job in the world. And I think in CT surgery, there's many reasons to to, to feel that way, yeah. right? Like you you want to walk away from it thinking like, wow, I've done some really cool work today. Um, some Not all days make you feel like that. And then if that's happening consistently and it makes you less excited about preparing for a case or reading about materials mm -hmm. in CT surgery, well, then maybe those are sort of subtle signs of burnout that you're experiencing that you might just want to shoo away as thinking that you're fatigued. Um, but yeah, it could be something more insidious than that. How do you come out of it? How do you specifically come out of it? You know, uh, I think I think part of it is up to you and I think part of it is yeah. up to the environment that you're in. Got it. Um, I have been in environments where I go back to it and then I come home feeling rejuvenated every single day. Mm. And there are people without a doubt in any specialty, in any sector that can make you feel that way during this working process, right? You're always going to work with people that you love to work with and also people that you find it challenging to work with. And depending on how that works, you got, you got to fight, figure out a way to navigate that landscape because yeah. that's realistic. Yeah. You know, like never at any point in your career are you going to be working in a hospital with colleagues that you all get along 100% with, with staff that all you know, that that all cater to your needs and et cetera. Like not every day of training or your career is meant to be designed for you. And I think yeah. that's a very realistic portrayal of what the world is. Yeah. Um. So 
you ha- you have to figure out a way to to balance those aspects of things and 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 for me thankfully like they 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 come one after another you know they kind of they balance themselves out over time and you kind of have to figure out a way of of hanging in there when it's challenging and then really enjoying it when it's fun uh, and so that's that's all i can really say yeah yeah do you do anything like meditation or walks or um, what did some people say? It's like uh, yoga or uh, I was talking to an emergency medicine doc the other day. He says he surfs occasionally. Anything <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, honestly, uh, sometimes I think people think of wellness as a prescribed set of activities yeah. and therefore a lot of the educational or administrative projects yeah. that are directed at resident wellness are sort of like see this counselor yeah. or try these activities and et cetera. And I think sometimes it works, but sometimes it misses the mark. Mm. Because what you're doing is not fully understanding where that burnout is coming from and just prescribing a set of activities that you think are just generally good for that. Mm. As I mentioned earlier, the pain points are not necessarily obvious to to an outside observer. Sometimes leaning in more and working harder is the prescription that you're looking for. Sometimes a good conversation with an attending that you respect to help you get through the, the the conundrum or the the thing that you can't understand to help you get past that, that's what you're looking for to 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 overcome burnout, mm-hmm. right? So to me, like it really depends on understanding what that person is stuck on before necessarily thinking about something like yoga or yeah. meditation. I mean, I I don't do yoga regularly. Ah. I can't stay disciplined <laughs> enough for it. I I tried meditating. I fall asleep. Yes, you know, uh, I like watering plants in the yeah. morning around the house. Honestly, for some reason, like ever since I was a kid, you know, my dad used to take me like gardening and stuff yeah. in this lot that that he had in, in South Korea. You know, it was a very, very industrial environment. So his company used to have this like small lot where we used to grow tomatoes and yeah. stuff. And I even now when I wake up on a Saturday morning, um, I, I water plants yeah. and I put on music and it's extremely calming. And I just kind of like approach my day that way, you know? How many plants do you have? Uh, many enough that I can't tell you the exact number <laughs> off the top of my head. I think something like in the 20s or 30s. So is your immediate family in the, in the U.S. now entirely? So not anymore. Okay. So when we came over here when I was 10, yeah, uh, we settled in Jersey. Okay. And then my mom came over, but my dad still had to keep a job in yeah. Korea. So in actually in Korean culture, that's a very common phenomenon. Okay. Um, so he never fully came over. And then my brother and I went to college. And then my mom went back to Korea to join him. Got and, it. You know, thinking back, I used to say like, I spent half my life in Korea and half my life in the States. Yeah. As more time goes on, obviously that becomes skewed. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that was already more than 10 years ago. Wow. wow. So they, they live in Korea. Okay. Uh, stepping back, how is it being an immigrant in America, because you were in, lived in Korea for ten years, right? Yeah. No one in your family—I I don't know if you have any younger brothers or sisters—was born in America, correct? No, no, no. I have a younger brother, but yeah, he was—he was just a couple of years younger when we came Got here. It. So, uh, being an immigrant in America, <clears throat> it's really interesting. Sometimes when I enter into an OR, yeah, I feel like I'm getting flashbacks to my immigrant experience, okay. and I say that because, like, fundamentally, you're entering a new environment with a different culture, with a different language, with people who perceive you as entering into their ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Um, So a lot of it is about kind of learning to observe first before you assert. Got it. And I think that that really brings me back to the mindset of being an immigrant. Yeah. And when I was growing up, obviously being an immigrant is a complicated experience. And the way that I feel about my Korean identity to this day is complicated. I, I don't even... There were times in my life where I was like, I need to reject that to become fully assimilated. And there are times in my life, like right now, you know, where I'm like, I should, I should embrace that yeah. as a part of my immigrant identity, yeah. you know? And, um, and when I enter into an OR, I get flashbacks of that. <clears throat> because there are some people who go into an OR and then I think, you know, want to be able to assimilate it as quickly as possible, but don't understand really, have different styles of doing it. For me it's kind of like the first time that I showed up to my fifth grade class. You know, before I say anything, I'm observing it three times. Yeah. And then maybe before I do something on my own, I'm asking, is this something that's helpful for me to do for you guys right now? So in that way, in the way that I kind of, I guess, gradually learned to integrate myself into this community, 
I'm trying to integrate myself into the OR culture. So I, I see many similarities between the two. How do you feel about that personal and peripheral observation yeah. that's being done three times before you make a decision or do something, right? Because most people would think they come into a room, they say whatever they think, they do whatever they think. Do you think it's a good thing? Do you think it's a bad thing? Or do you think it's just a thing that is? Um, at the moment, I think it's just a thing that is that has certain negative consequences. Yeah. It's, it's protective in some ways for a reason, I yeah. think, right? I mean, uh, when somebody comes into a cardiac surgical OR, oftentimes before they ask a question, there's so much they need to take in. Like before they touch the bypass tubing that's on the field, you should probably, you know, really understand what's going on here and what, what it's secured to because there's five liters a minute of blood flowing through that thing, right? At the same time, I do wish that the field of surgery in general could be more accessible. That's one of the things that I really try to stress when I talk to a med student or somebody who's interested in going to the field of CT surgery. I say, stop addressing me as somebody who's so distant from you. If you have a question about the field one day or if you, have, if you need advice about how you can apply into it and stuff, just text me like you're texting a friend. Because I do think that perception drives a lot of people away from the field of surgery. The hierarchy? Yeah, the hierarchy, this feeling that the person who's 10 years ahead of you is, you know, a different, a, at a different stage of life fundamentally than you are. I mean, sure, they've been in the field much longer, but we should have people who are accessible and relatable in the field of surgery. Yeah. Like, period, I think. It just makes everyone feel more comfortable in the OR. When med students come into the operating room, they can ask questions without feeling like there will be consequences or potentially getting yelled at, right? Or judged. Like, these are important things that we have to intentionally tease away because the stereotype right now, unfortunately which is probably based on some aspects of reality, is that people are going to be scared coming into an OR. It's inherently a scary experience. And that's why I say like, like immigration. I understand mm -hmm. what it feels like for that second year med student to come into a CT surgery OR for the first time. Because I can see the trepidation in their eyes that I probably had when I was younger mm -hmm. immigrating, yeah. right? So for them to, to feel more comfortable means that as, a, as the person in charge of that room, you have to anticipate their anxieties yeah. and then make it, make it intentionally known that, that you are accessible and that you are a person, not just some like… Figure like, in the sky. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, you know, I think more and more surgeons should try to make themselves as human as possible in the eyes of society. You know, I know that there's many conversations or narratives that are based around surgery to make it seem like it's larger than life or more than human, but it doesn't have to be any of that kind of stuff because… You're just, you're just people doing a particular kind of work. And the more we try to separate ourselves from, you know, just, just performing our work as people, the, the less successful we seem. Yeah, no, I love that. And I, I, I hope people adopt that. And I've had good experiences at Jefferson. Yeah. And I'm sure you've had great good experiences as Penn. But I've heard different experiences. But I really love that. And hopefully many doctors and surgeons will adopt that mindset. I think, <laughs> and I think it's, honestly, I think it's going that way. Yeah, I, think I agree. Talking to, I mean, you're only ten years back, and I was talking to some attendings who are fifty years back. They see, they've seen changes, right? Dramatic changes, and Dramatic I'm hoping changes. it's going to keep going in that direction. What is the best thing about CT surgery? The best thing about CT best surgery, thing. yeah. Um, there's, <laughs> there's no other profession in life, I think, where you go into your job, somebody is really seriously in need of the care that they need to like essentially live longer and live without pain. They enlist you for your specialized set of skills. That's what the hospital expects you to do. That's what your employer expects you to do. You go into the OR and you perform an activity that's like the favorite thing in the world for you to perform. You feel confident in it. You have fun doing it. And then you do that for eight to however many hours. And then you walk out of that operation, you get to tell the family that everything went well, and they get to end the most anxiety provoking chapter of their lives. And you get to go home feeling you've done some good, right? I mean, how many jobs in the world do you simultaneously get to have that kind of meaningful connection with somebody to perform a technical procedure that makes you feel like you're having fun and you're enjoy really enjoying it and then walk away from it knowing that you get to do that every single day and simultaneously it's a job that's well regarded in society and, and well compensated, right? Like there's very few things like that in life, yeah. right? I mean, I can think of certain jobs that, that may be better compensated, but doesn't have the human element or the service element. 
I can think of jobs where, you know, you may have more of a human component, but you don't get to be as procedural or technical or get to feel like you're learning on, you're working on your craft mm-hmm. and get to be creative and get to be uh, focused on your performance and et cetera. Those are all fun things, right? It yeah. just ties together in a perfect way and balance that if you set up your practice right, you get to feel that for a 40-year career. Wow. Like, what else is there like that? Yeah, that's amazing. So the counterpoint to that question is, of course, what is the worst thing about CT surgery? The worst thing about CT surgery is that no matter how good of a day you have, you're always open to the possibility of being humbled by something unpredictable. You know, like you may think that you have done a perfect operation. And then for some circumstances outside of what you thought you could anticipate, the patient may have a bad outcome. Or just as much, you know, you can go into an operation feeling like you have the plan for it, the perfect plan for it, and then walk away from that operation wondering, did I do the right thing here? Right? Yeah. Like that's, that's a part of your everyday thought process. And just as how those questions can be extremely stimulating and rewarding, it can really drive you to feel a lot of stress on a day-to-day basis. I and mean, that's just a part of your job going forward. And I do think that the growth of a surgeon is balancing that and making it something that you're okay with every day. And, but it's, it's not, I think the stress level is not necessarily something that everybody wants to feel on a day-to-day basis, mm-hmm. right? Some people want to have operations where you do not have a risk of going back in the middle of the night because a graft went down or you're exsanguinating into the chest, right? Like you want to, some people want to minimize the, the chance that you have to go back with a phone call in the middle of the night, et cetera, and then, and then worry about outcomes and then worry about whether you did the, the thing that, whether the operation you performed earlier may have technically failed in some ways. Yeah. Um, but for us, that's a part of our day-to-day job. Yeah. yeah. Tough question here because I'm asking you to look five years into the future. <laughs> I want you to imagine that you yeah. finished your training and your three years as an attending. After these three years as an attending, I give you $100 million tax-free. It's in your bank account. Do whatever you want with it. Do you A, continue practicing full-time? Do you B, start practicing part-time? Do you C, switch careers entirely and maybe do, I don't know, something random? Or do you D, go live on the beach with your wife and, and soon-to-be family? Yeah. Um, I will be frac- – if, if I win $100 million, yeah. um, I'm definitely going to still practice full-time because – Money doesn't change the fact that like I'm going to enjoy what I do right now the most. Yeah. You know, it's not like all of a sudden I can say, oh, I can finally switch to that specialty that's less well compensated <laughs> because I have a financial cushion. Um, at the same time, with that money, there's just so many things that I want to work on that I can't fund right now as a resident. But I one day imagine that I will be able to fund as an attending. Like for instance, if I wanted to work on an idea for a new device or an instrument in the OR, because... Some of the tools that we use in the OR have not been innovated in over 100 years, right? I mean, they're named after surgeons that you know lived 100 years ago, right? So, for instance, knowing all the things that we know about ergonomics and the importance of, you know, surgeons' health long-term in terms of neck, neck, neck pain and, and, and spine health and, and wrist health and et cetera, like, why have, not, why have we not innovated those things meaningfully in the last 100 years? And... I, I have ideas about them. I just can't do them because of money, really. Yeah. But over time, I imagine with something like that, you can just spin out so many different ideas that you can work on, right? Yeah. I mean, there's limitless possibilities in terms of how you can change the field in some ways, entrepreneurially speaking. Yeah. So uh, I think that's what I would do. I think I would just have a lot more money to be able yeah. to spin out, uh, you know, start projects. <laughs> that's exciting. That's exciting. And you did start a project, right? Can you tell me a little bit more about... Actually, I want to take a step back. I want to see if there was an inception to this idea. Was there ever an encounter and ever, how did you know that people were more interested about learning more about surgery and like kind of the way specifically, technically, maybe these things work? Yeah. Uh, As I mentioned earlier, I've been interested in this idea of simulation for a long time and surgical education. But even beyond that, as I mentioned, as you start thinking about different types of career paths and, you know, look into the startup world, look into the media world, you realize that there are so many different opportunities to elevate your field, right? So one of the things that I notice is that media is a fundamental component of so many different things 
that we do as, as human beings. Whether it be fashion or sports or food, whatever it is, there is a space for people to have discourse to elevate the culture and to challenge the culture and have those types of nuanced conversations. What we're doing right now is an example of that. Mm -hmm. In surgery, there's no mainstream place for something like that. And it's mind-boggling because it's something that uh, I think it's quoted to it's quoted to be something that almost everybody in life is ex expected to experience at some point or at least have their loved ones go through it. The number is something like more than 100 million surgical pr procedures performed in the U.S. Wow. On, a, on an annual basis. So if you think about how universal it is, it's as important as sports and food, right? But people don't understand what it is that they're entering into until, until they have to be a part of it in a, serious, in a very, very serious way. And and the fund and the subject matter is fundamentally very interesting, right? There's when you're watching somebody sew or thinking about the needle angles and the different ways that things come together, it is artistic in some ways and it is performance driven in many ways, right? If you're looking at it not necessarily as this isolated subspecialty, but as a concept and a craft in and of itself, mm -hmm. it's really cool, mm -hmm. right? And I think sometimes we lose how cool it is because we don't have the space to talk about those types of things. And combined with my co-resident, who's also from like a documentary making background, wow. John Kelly, and this med student, Josh Chen. I know Josh, yes. yeah. We we essentially just ended up setting up a studio in, in my place and then seeing what kind of videos we can make in surgery that might be interesting and illuminating to, to a general audience. And that's sort of where we started as a proof of concept. And yeah. You know, I the first time that I realized that there might be something here is when we made this video that is not even really surgical. It's kind of parasurgical because what we did is we we came up with this random exercise where we wanted people to think about using forceps as something that you build dexterity in. So much of what you do in the OR depends on what you do with your with your non-dominant hand holding forceps to expose tissue, to handle delicate tissue, to position it in a certain way. Driving the needle is easier compared to picking up something exactly in the position that you wanted to and laying it down a certain way. So with the forceps, we came up with this random idea uh, called a rice transfer. You know, we set up like a little circle on a wooden board. Or oh, actual rice. It's not an acronym. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Real rice. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then we were like, you know, before you pick up real human tissue, like maybe you should work on your dexterity. And we came up with a list of exercises. But one one thing in particular, this rice transfer, for some reason, I guess, resonated with the rest of the world. Probably wow. because it was kind of bizarre and yeah. it was kind of interesting at the same time. There are like a bunch of surgical residents, for some reason, picking up rice and moving it over with forceps. Yeah, It's more challenging, I think, than it seems, right? Because it's a small grain that's sort of irregular in shape. Unless you pick it up well, it pops off. Uh. And you have to move it in an angle where it kind of lines it into the place that, that you're looking for. So we posted a video of a rice transfer challenge, essentially where we were timing ourselves as we were moving, you know, 12 to 15 grains of rice from one location to another. And then it took off on TikTok in a way that I did not anticipate. And this how, many, is, how many views? This is early on. Get? I mean, I think... Over that weekend, I think we hit 10 million views. Oh my God. Yeah, I know. That's insane. And, and a lot of people were people that would never be interested yeah. in surgery otherwise, yeah. right? Like kids. Yeah. Like watching this and being like, yeah, why are surgeons yeah. doing this? And and what is surgery anyway? You know, some Great of the questions to ask. Sometimes, you know, nurses at work come up to me and say, hey, like my kid at home really likes watching your videos and they have no idea what I do at my job yet, but they're like, oh, that seems kind of fun. Yeah. And I think that's what surgery has a potential to be in the eyes yeah. of society. Um, and then we don't realize just how much of a, a, an impact you can have in somebody's perception of surgery until you try to fill that space. Yeah. Right. I mean, these are not medical examples, but people frequently say that when Top Gun came out, military enrollment went up significantly. Mm. Right. And, this whole Formula One documentary is making the whole thing, you know, all of a sudden popular in the yeah. United States, a market that they have not been able to enter for for so many decades, right? So for surgery, what is the image that we're projecting currently and how much of a role can we play in making that seem fun and cool, Yeah, right? I think that's fundamentally what I've been trying to do with this project. You know, I the project is called The Modern Surgeon. And uh, at the moment, we're 
essentially a social media and multimedia driven project, trying to fill that culture and the media space of surgery. Definitely needs to be filled. It's almost like a casual intro to surgery and then people can maybe delve deeper to learn more about the nitty gritty things than the, the rice shot. Maybe I should try. Rice <laughs> yeah, we'll have like to that. invite you yeah. to, to our studio one day. I'd love to do that. And then get you doing, and uh, there's a bunch of challenges that we want to I'm going to fail though and it's going to be, it's going to hurt my cred and immensely because I'm not going to be able to do anything. It's going to be really bad. So let's take a step back. Let's take a more general sense uh, of kind of lifestyle and stuff like that. Yeah. Do you have any tips for people going through the whole career of medicine, and this could be anything. This could be lifestyle. This could be finances. This could be relationships. Anything. Anything that you said, wow, I wish uh, someone told me about this when I was starting a career of, a long career in yeah. medicine. No, I mean, uh, I think in general, the way that you can feel about your career and the contentment that you can derive from it is entirely up to the choices that you make, you know, and the mindset that you decide to harbor. Yeah. And I don't think, I don't think we talk about that enough. We always focus on like the objective realities, the number of hours, the policies, and et cetera. Like I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I think that's a great starting yeah. point. But how you choose to structure your career and the choices you make and the lines you draw, learning to say no, like those are all things that are at the end of the day, some things that you need to think about and then intentionally make choices about, right? And, and those things are far more challenging than navigating just the policies, yeah. right? So for me, like so many times in my life, I've wanted to wish away time. And what that means uh, in the context of medical training is that like, I kept thinking, I can't wait to be done with med school so I can start this surgical residency. And I can't wait to be done with training so that I can become an attending. And sure enough, if I keep thinking like that, then I'll say, oh, I can't wait till I'm not a junior attending anymore so I can have a different set of, you know, roles and I can't and then and then I'll say I can't wait to be a chief somewhere so that I can work on these projects that I've been meaning to since 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. If you keep thinking like that, you're always going to postpone the meaningful impact and the happiness that you can derive from the day-to-day -day decisions right now, right? Like residency has to be an enjoyable thing and not a means to an end, right? And you have to realize it yourself. Like when I go to work every single day, I'm not thinking uh, okay, countdown, how many more days until I'm done training? I'm thinking this is a day of my life. It's a, it's a huge component and a chapter of my life, right? You can't wish away a decade of your life. You got to make each, each of those days feel great to you. And, and that's the only way I think you can really find gratification and happiness long-term in a surgical residency. Yeah. And, and it, part of that comes with figuring out the pace at which you want to go. I mean, there used to be time paradoxically, where I was like, oh, I have this free time that I can be productive with so that when I produce something, it'll make me happy. But, but I mean, really, sometimes I think back on that, especially as I'm, you know, spending time with my wife at home and expecting a, a baby boy. I think really maybe the key to happiness is the opposite of that. The moments that make you feel so engaged in the things that are present in your life and family that you're not even really asking yourself, am I being productive at this moment? Maybe I was thinking backwards the whole time. Yeah. You know, like, and there are going to be, I think, those moments where you fundamentally shift the way that you think about your life and work. And, and those are the things that make your day-to-day -day, like more or less happy, more or less meaningful, more or less engaged. And you navigate that. So, yeah. uh, so yeah, I, I think that's how I look at that balance. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And if you were talking to first year of medical school, Jason, would you tell him anything? I think, I think that's what I would say. I yeah, that thing. Be be more patient. Yeah. You know, I I know that my first year of med school self was so impatient trying to get to where I wanted to be twenty years. But I think at that time I could have just told myself to to not look at it as a means to an end. You know, like the the. the the experience of a med school, I, and I know most med students at some point think, oh, God, I, I can't believe, you know, I have to spend all this time learning all these different materials and stuff, all these rotations that, that I may not ultimately end up going into. I know that I want to be a cardiac surgeon, so why am I on an ob -GYN rotation, et cetera? I've been there, right? But uh, all of it is just part of the experience, and you get to go into it with a totally open mind yeah. and finding some sort of fascination in something that you didn't expect or you can kind of go into it with a closed mind and keep wishing away time 
ob labor and delivery experience during med school was one of the most gratifying experiences in my entire four years of med school. It was, uh, but I don't think I would have had that experience had I been so impatient to become a cardiac yeah. surgeon. Yeah, lean in. I think we, I love that. <laughs> I love it. I'm stealing. I'm saying it every podcast now forever. <laughs> lean in. You got to lean in. So into the nitty gritty stuff. Mm-hmm. If I'm a third year, second year, first year medical student, and I know I want to be a CT surgeon, how can I make myself the most competitive, the most able to match into a competitive residency program? Yeah. And that's a really good question because more and more it feels like we're asking med students to be prepared earlier and earlier. And I have complicated feelings about that. You know, like it really shouldn't feel like an arms race on the first day of med school, needing to come in, knowing what you want to do, and then building your resume that early on. You know, I really wish it weren't like that because it, like I said, that kind of forces you to make decisions earlier and not be open-minded throughout the entire process. But speaking nitty gritty, yeah. like practical advice wise, if if you're thinking that you are interested in the field of CT surgery, <clears throat> I think there are three things that you need to focus on early. As I mentioned, you need to get yourself in an operative environment and know who you are and then really understand whether the flow of the operation and all that stuff is something that becomes more familiar and enjoyable to you or not. Like you got to really answer that question for yourself because that's, that's the hard part about choosing. While you're understanding who you are as an adult, like you're also trying to figure out that you're not too far behind on the other aspects of your application that will make you competitive. CT surgery is a highly academic field by nature, right? So even though a lot of people can ultimately end up in private practices, training is conducted at mostly academic institutions, right? So you have to think about what kind of research experience you may want to have. Because, I mean, the, the goal is not to have a long CV to get your foot in the door the goal is to prove to somebody that you are interested in making the field better and patient care better. And the questions that you may be asking or the projects that you're involved in, therefore, can be broad. But it means that you want to engage with it as something more than just a checkbox. Yeah. Right. So you have to go to an interview and say, you know, I looked at the field of CT surgery. This is something that means a lot to me. I think I can make the field better in the long term by answering these questions. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're somebody who's interested in research using data sets. Maybe you code and can come up with an app that makes practicing surgery easier. Maybe you're somebody who's going to liaise, like you said, like we talked about earlier, in some sort of like a more broader entrepreneurial sense. But you got to have these types of ideas and, and kind of start playing with them. Yeah. And then seeing what you can make happen with them. Because a lot of the things that you have to get, you know, you have to do to get to the point of CT surgery is is not scripted, right? No one's going to give you a roadmap and say, here's how to become a competitive internal medicine applicant. Like there's probably more scripted ways of doing that than t- for CT surgery. It's such a, it's such a niche thing. Yeah. There's only, you know, at least the kind of program that I'm in, there's only like 30 to 35 spots in the country every year. No one's going to tell you the right formula for success. There's yeah. there's going to be highly variable opinions about that. But that means that you have to get yourself in the door early and listen to all these different types of opinions and think to yourself, what is my role in this field? And every step of it is going to feel like you're being the go-getter because no one's going to be inviting you into CT surgery interest group conversations yeah. where you're you know expected to attend. Yeah. And you're going to be sending those emails and you're going to be making those phone calls. So I think a lot of, as I mentioned, being in an operative environment, um, having some sort of academic interest budding early on, and then finding the appropriate mentors for that, and then networking so that you can steep yourself in the kind of advice and conversations that you want to have in this field early on are the the three things that you should do early. Yeah, that's really helpful. Now, switching from the seller, what if I am the buyer and I'm interested and maybe I'm in my third or fourth year of medical school and I'm extremely competitive, you know, I'm top of the range. How do I, <laughs> how do I decide what residency program I want to go into? Specifically, we're talking about CT surgery. Do I opt for, how do you, I guess I want to know how you make the decision. Say you know CT surgery. Should you always do the residency that's just CT surgery from the get-go? Should you do the general surgery one? And this is like a seven-part question. And then how do you decide which programs where to train? Yeah. Um, controversial. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm partially biased towards this long residency experience because it's been so helpful for me. Um, I see pros and cons both ways. You know, you have more years and time to learn cardiology, 
cardiac surgery, vascular surgery, things that you may not if you're doing a traditional general surgery residency, doing a lot of other different types of operations, and then coming into it, having a more shortened, accelerated experience and introduction to CT surgery in two to three years. So I think in that sense, it gives you more time. It gives you time to understand the research landscape of cardiac surgery, and it gives you more time to network with cardiac surgeons around the country. So I think, I think in that sense, it's highly beneficial to, to be in an accelerated program. At the same time, I think general surgery gives you, uh, just by the nature of general surgical training, you're in the OR a lot already before you ever make a decision about going to CT surgery. You lead a team because you've been a chief resident and you've made sacrifices, like real sacrifices that med students, I think, can never fully understand during a three-month sub I. You've made that for the past seven years and you still want to be a cardiac surgeon because you're like, well, this makes me happy, right? There's, there's a level of maturity and leadership in that that I could not have simulated no matter how hard I tried during med school. And that comes with some really important sense of emotional stability, something that can prevent burnout and attrition long-term for your career. You know, so in that sense, I think there is a huge benefit to coming in with a lot more experience under your belt. In terms of thinking about how to choose programs, you know, I always, I always tell this to applicants, you know, when you first start applying to programs, you think that the right program that you choose is going to determine 90% of your career trajectory. But really, it's the other way around. Like, the programs determine 10% of your career and you determine 90%. That means you have to understand what kind of learner you are. There are programs that may be slower in terms of operative volume, but every single day you're going to have you know, more one-to-one -one attending time, more opportunities to discuss the case before and after. You know, there's not as much volume, so you don't necessarily have to feel like you're rushed in any sense or jumping from one place to another. You're going to be in that operation, learning one thing and then going home, sleeping, processing. Like those are really valuable learning opportunities. And then there will be places where, you know, it's going to be very, very busy and then maybe a lot of the stuff that you have to do, you have to fight for. You know, you may be thrown into situations where you may not have necessarily felt like you were 100% ready. I think that's part of any residency, but there's different styles of training that, that you have to know what you're more comfortable with. You know, like if you're the kind of person who wants to be you know, a little bit overwhelmed every single day, and you're, that's your happy state, then, then you, you choose a certain type of program. If you're the kind of person who wants 100% structure, then you choose a different kind of program. And I think you got to know that about yourself. If you're, if you're the buyer, yeah. I think you kind of learn to categorize programs into different buckets based on that. You know, is this, is this the kind of program that, that offers that kind of structure? But I know that I may not necessarily be having as much unstructured free times for growth. Well, th maybe that's you. Maybe they put you on a course. Um, I think a lot of general surgery residencies kind of like that because it's been around much longer and they have a formula for success. That's, that's, maybe that's the path that you're comfortable with. Maybe the opposite is true for some people. I will also say that the importance of good colleagues and good culture cannot uh, be overstated. You know, I, uh, like we don't think about how lonely CT surgical residency training is. Right? If you think about it, most programs have either a one, one resident per class or two. Right, you're already lonely. Right, you're going from you're you're having stressful days. You're going into different ORs. You have to liaise with hundreds of people who expect you to perform at a certain level. You go to many different hospitals, you know, and all of this you have to do kind of alone, right? And most days you may go to a hospital and then you come home. And then you never had really had a chance to connect with your co-residents because they're all on their separate rotations doing separate things. Like think about how lonely that could be, yeah. especially when you come home and you feel like you haven't had the best day. Maybe somebody gave you criticism that you're not, you know, you're not able to uh, feel comfortable about, or maybe you're feeling like you made a complication that 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 you just want to talk to someone about. Yeah. Right? So you you gotta have people around you who can help you process that and. You know, CT surgery training, like we talked about earlier, highly competitive, oftentimes terms that are sort of thrown around are like, you know, swimming with the sharks and et cetera. Like, can you really show vulnerability in front of the people around you and trust that they're not going to take advantage of it in some way, but instead be supportive? That's, that's a really tough question mm -hmm. to ask yourself in a program. And you don't want to find yourself in a situation 
where you get there thinking that that's the kind of culture that you're walking into, but then not necessarily what you end up finding once you get there. Like wow. these are really important questions. I mean, because you're spending how many hours in a week? 160 or something like that? 80 hours are in the hospital and then you have to sleep sometime, right? <laughs> so yeah. most of your waking life is in the hospital. Yeah, yeah. You really have to enjoy the people that you're working yeah. with. I mean, otherwise, you know, if you're not laughing in the OR and if you're not laughing when you're transporting patients to the ICU at three in the morning because you feel tense around the people, then, wow, that's that's tough. Yeah. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to perform your life's work at the expense of being comfortable in a community. Yeah. Right. You want to yeah. do those things simultaneously. Yeah. No, that's, uh, it's super important. Sorry, go ahead. No, you're totally right. The cult, the culture is advancing in that direction. So I think uh, more and more we're trying to make collegial uh, characteristics one of the most important things that we look for, uh, a team player, more so than a superstar necessarily, yeah. right? So society is expecting that. Hospitals are expecting that. Your colleagues are expecting that. So that's becoming something that's on the forefront of our minds as opposed to an afterthought. Yeah. What are the characters, characteristics, I hate that word, of someone <laughs> who would excel in CT surgery? Yeah, uh, that's really tough. I mean, that sort of depends on the philosophy yeah. that you Sounds have. Sounds like teamwork is de definitely one of them. Without a doubt. Yeah. And then going into the future, like you not only have to be able to do well in an operation, but you have to be able to make your team feel a part of something, something safe yeah. and something open. If you can't do that, I think in this day and age, your staff are going to refuse to work with you. You know, like you don't want to happen. People well, refuse to work with people unofficially, right? Yeah. I mean, like I'm sure you've been in situations yeah. where you're probably like, "Oh, I don't look forward to working with that person today." And you don't want your staff to feel that way about you, right? Because yeah. then every single day you're kind of making it obligatory for someone to work with you. Yeah, you want them to feel like, "I love my job, and I can't wait to work with this surgeon tomorrow. I know tomorrow's going to be be a good day, so tonight I'm not going to stress about it." That's the kind of like leader you want to be as a surgeon. Um, and it's going to be expected, I think, more and more of surgeons in the future. Yeah. Other characteristics, um, and I think about this a lot because I think about the deficits in the selection process for surgeons a lot right now, right? Like we have a standard interview and we read an application to get a sense of whether you, you know, want to become a surgeon or whether you'd be a good surgeon in 10 years time, right? <clears throat> but if I were to think about three exercises that I think surgeons should be able to do in order to perform their jobs well, and maybe I would even want to ask them during an interview, <clears throat> is one, I think I would give them an objective that they need to accomplish and a set of tools to do it. And I would say, figure out the best way that you want to do this. And I'll check, ben, check back with you at the end of the day. And then you tell me what you came up with. Mm. What, what does that require you to do? You have to Fundamentally think about how you're using your tools, what goal you want to accomplish, and then optimize the path to it so that you're not necessarily repeating your steps. You're not, you know, coming up with an imperfect product like that. That's a mindset, I think, of performing an operation. That's important throughout your whole career. Two, I think you have to be able to get people on your side to accomplish something. Um, it means starting conversations with staff you've never met before. You got to do that again and again and again and again, right? I mean… So much of my residency experience is about meeting a bedside nurse for the first time, asking a set of questions that takes time for them to answer, and then suggesting that maybe we tweak something or maybe we can like try these things and then and then check in with you later again, you know? Like that's that's interpersonal. Yeah. More than it is surgical. So, you know, I, I always thought it'd be fun if we ask an applicant. You know, it's, it's, here's a challenge for you. You know, you're obviously not from this hospital. During this time period, your goal is to go to a floor that you've never been to. And then maybe you can get a group of five to eight nurses to take a selfie with you. You know, like, <laughs> I know that sounds kind of yeah. completely unrelated and benign. Yeah. But I mean, what is your job as an intern on a daily basis? It's that. Right? Yeah. Hey, hey, my name is Jason. It's nice to meet you. I'm a surgical applicant. I may be a resident here one day. I know this is really yeah. like not what you're expecting, but can we, do you mind, like, can we corral maybe five to 10 people together here and then, and then do something? Yeah. You know, that's, that takes, that takes like subtle interpersonal skills yeah. that a lot of stereotypical surgeons would be really bad at. Like you can't go into a, a floor at a random hospital and be like, 
hey, everybody, like, I need you to stand here right now because I need this to get into uh -huh. the, my dream residency. People aren't going to respond yeah. to that, right? And you want to be able to understand these things about, about applicants and surgeons, I think, early on. Like, these are, the, these are the nuances that make you an effective resident. Yeah. You know, so um, if I were to re-envision the, the application process, I think these are the questions I'd be asking. Yeah, no, that, that's really interesting. Maybe you will. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you will one be the day. person. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> Speaking of the future, what are your long-term plans? Where do you see yourself in 10, 20 years? Yeah. I mean, technically speaking, I'm, yeah. I want to practice in academic adult cardiac surgery. Yeah. And these are, you know, distinction that you, these are decisions you have to make in your career. You know, when you go into cardiothoracic surgery, you think about whether you want to become cardiac heavy or thoracic heavy, whether you want to be in an academic environment versus a non-academic environment. Although the lines between those two things are becoming more and more blurred, you can be you can be in a traditionally non-academic hospital and still have academic aspects of your career, like research, being involved in national societies, doing projects, teaching fellows, etc. Those are becoming more and more blurred. And so therefore, I think I just want to have academic components to my career. I don't know what setting quite yet. Yeah. And then you decide whether you want to do adult practice or congenital. I think that comes with a lot of different specific questions as well. Um, if I'm answering more vaguely about my long-term goals, um, I think the goal is to be in an environment <clears throat> where you can feel like you're giving yourself to a very meaningful arc both at an individual level, but also on a longer term in a community. You know, so you can answer that in a lot of different ways. Maybe it means being at a high-powered hospital with a lot of resources and doing really complex cases. And for some people, I think that's, that's what they want to do, right? Some people, advancing the career means taking the most complex operation and then, and then getting somebody through it. And that's really important because yeah. maybe, maybe you are that patient one day and you need to go to somebody who only likes to think about the coronary artery position in this, you know, highly, you know, complicated disease redo setting or whatever, right? For me, I think I want to be somebody who approaches my career a little bit more broadly in terms of the kind of services that I can offer. And I say that because ultimately that's more versatile, not only in highly specialized settings, but also in, you know, uh, low resource settings where you may not be the aortic surgeon or the LVAD surgeon, but you need to be able to perform a lot of different varieties of operations well for an underserved population. Simultaneously, <clears throat> I think I want, like I mentioned earlier, I think I want a significant academic or research component or entrepreneurial component to my career that focuses on that human aspect of either being a surgeon or being a patient or being a family member. So, what are the things that we're not looking at right now? We already talked about the other projects that I'm involved mm -hmm. in, but the clinic, right? Who's studying that right now? Is there a room to have conversations in a way where you can make each pre-op consent process or, or you know, ex setting expectations and et cetera, can we make that more uniform in terms of quality among different surgeons? Yeah. And what are the aspects that you're looking for? What are the words that, that we choose in an operating in, in an operative setting that has negative connotations that we can all get away from? And how can we clarify our communication so that patients are walking away from it thinking the same thing that we're telling them? Yeah. I, we, you know, I know that these are aspects that we focus on more broadly. In my particular field, we just have not gotten there yet. That's a barrier. And I, and I want to focus on more and more of that so that people in the world can when they're thinking about surgery, it doesn't become just this intimidating thing that their mind shut down to as soon as we throw technical jargons out there and they can't follow it. Yeah. But rather, it becomes something that, that they want to engage with. Yeah, no, that's really important. And I think that's another gap, the clinic. I think it's a huge, huge gap. Um, two more questions and then we're, we're out of here. Yeah, right. Extremely important question, probably the most important question of this <laughs> entire interview. Uh, what's your favorite music to listen to in the OR? <laughs> <laughs> it is an important question. <laughs> Um, my favorite music is something that I'm not able to play right now in the OR because I think everyone would kind of fall asleep to it. And honestly, I, you know, I like classical music in the OR. And, and I say this because... Composer of specific... Um, it changes. When I was growing yeah. up, I liked big, complicated things yeah. like Debussy and, yeah. and Chopin and Rachmaninoff. More and more, you know, as I get quote-unquote older, I just like, like simpler 
even some things that I used to find kind of formulaic, like repetitive, you know, fugues that are, you know, by Bach or mm -hmm. simple melodies by Mozart, some pieces by Beethoven. And I, I don't know why my brain is changing in that way. You know, when I was growing up, my mom used to take me and my brother to a, a concert, like, I don't know, once every two months or so. And then I used to sleep through them all the time. And she used to wake <laughs> us up in the morning for school with classical music blaring. So I hated it. You know, I hated that concept. But as I get older, there's something calming about it. You know, we talked about flow state in yeah. the OR. You know, there are music that disrupt that flow state and there are music that intensify that flow state. For me, classical music and even neoclassical music really, really deepen that flow state. Like it's, it's stimulating. You can kind of keep tempo in your mind and almost kind of get a sense of progress throughout the song in a way that I can't when I'm listening to the top 40 soundtrack yeah. or the same Taylor Swift song for the 50th Dua time, Libra. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, uh, I don't get to play that music right now, but one day I will. Why don't you get to play it? The attending commands it or what? No, I just think it's a very quick way to become unpopular. In the yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I guess I can't say that, right? The whole teamwork nine thing we discussed. We just right, had, yeah. exactly. Like, you know, at the end of the day, if you're with a team at 1 a.m. and you're closing a chest, yeah, you want to play music that get everyone feeling good and yeah. energetic and not necessarily something that 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 you just enjoy. Right? Yeah. yeah. But but one day I think for at least the core components of operations where I really enjoy, I think I will line it up with classical music. Yeah. You know, there are stories of surgeons who who uh, understand exactly how many minutes it's been in their operation because of where they are in a symphony. You know, like that kind of stuff is, That's cool. is fun. That's cool. And you haven't gotten to do it yet? You haven't played classical music in a, any procedure yet? Uh, I do sometimes. Okay, good, yeah. good, 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 good. good. <laughs> Usually if the patient requests it. Yeah. I'll just say, oh, cool. Let's Perfect. Do that. <laughs> you, don't, you don't give them some money under the table to like request Chopin or something yeah. like that. Let's do it. <laughs> one day. One, one day, day we'll get it. Perfect. Well, this has been really, really helpful. Do you have any closing words or any closing thoughts for, it could be people in general, it could be medical students who are interested in surgery, um, it could be classical music enthusiasts, anything at all? Yeah, I... <laughs> I don't have any words for classical okay. music enthusiasts, <laughs> but, but people who are interested in surgery, especially med students, I want them to think, you know, there are stereotypes about any field. And the first encounter with any field is stereotypes. You know, like you're going to watch, nowadays you're going to watch Twitter videos that highlight that stereotype comedically, you know, um, or factually. And, and sometimes you're going to be tempted to make decisions about your life based on the stereotype that's been set before you. Don't make your decisions based on stereotypes that were set before you. Think about the stereotypes that you can set by changing the stereotype entering the field you're interested in, right? So if surgery is intimidating to you, like don't let that turn you away from it. Think about the potential that you get to have in it by being, being who you want to be as a surgeon. Like one day, because you didn't run away from this intimidating stereotype, you're going to talk to somebody and they're going to say, oh, like maybe it is possible to be a warm, nice surgeon. That goes against the stereotypes that I've been taught in TV perhaps. But it gives them a realistic career opportunity and a possibility, right? So um, I've worried about this thing my whole life. I still think about this question all the time because the culture of cardiac surgery especially is, is complicated and challenging. So I don't want to downplay or sugarcoat the experiences that you may have. It's going to be challenging. But by holding on to your values and not necessarily turning away from it, you get to change that stereotype. And I think that's what's really exciting about entering a field that may initially be intimidating. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Jason. And we can find you at The Modern Surgeon on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all these places. Uh, and you want to give your personal Twitter as well? It's Jason Han MD. Is it yeah, Jason yeah. Han MD yeah. Twitter? Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Jason. This has been really, really helpful. Yeah, thank you. I had a great time talking. Thanks, Jason. Perfect.